Hi, it's Alan Edelman and Philip de Corgi, and today's lecture is about introspection. As a common English word, introspection usually means looking inside yourself to kind of figure out who you really are, what do you value, what you really think. And in the case of software, introspection is the ability of the code to describe itself. And this is not something you see very often, but it's a very, very powerful ability if a language is introspective, and I think you'll like it. So let me start by giving some examples of looking under the hood. So here, A and B are two complex numbers. Okay, we could write them as one plus two M, or you could actually just write them as complex of one comma two. And uh, there's the concept of an angle of a complex number. And so how are we going to derive the angle? You know how it is. You draw it in the complex plane and you, 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 know, you, you look at the angle with respect to the x-axis. Um, so if you, you can actually, in Julia, type at which, that's the command, at which, and then apply angle of A. It's important that you don't just say angle, but you apply angle to an argument, something that actually gets executed. And you can click on it. And sure enough, you can see right there, up there in yellow, let's make it a little bit bigger, just so everybody can see it. You can see right there uh, is the definition of angle, right there on line 561. And it's defined as the um, two argument arctan, which some of you may remember how that works. Uh, that, that's get the two argument one gives you the signs correctly. And so you take the, the, the imaginary part of Z, which is a real number, and the real part of Z, which is another, real number, and that is the angle function. Okay, Or if I want to look at multiplication of a complex number by a real number, I could type at which here, and I look, and I find it that uh, if you take a complex z times a real x, what do you get? Well, you take x times the real part of z, and also x times the imaginary part of z, just like you learned in mathematics. But again, it's, there's something reassuring it's not that it's a surprise, but there's something reassuring about being able to look at it and see what it's doing. Okay. Uh, here's also complex times complex. You could take a quick look at that one while we're at it. And you can see that um, you know, there's the real times the real, the real times imaginary, and so forth. There's four multiplies, an add, and a subtract. Right? So if I kind of, I've already kind of solved this for you, but let's kind of review. If I actually were to count the multiplies and adds, when I go a complex times a real, think about it for a moment, there's two multiplies and, and no adds. And a complex com times a complex, we just looked at it, there's four multiplies, you know, real, 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 imaginary, 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 real. Four multiplies, and I don't know if you want to count those two adds or one add and one subtract, but you got it. Okay. And there's a tip here if you're actually wanting to do this um, in the terminal REPL rather than in one of the notebooks. Okay. So... One thing to note is this star here is serving two different purposes on a computer. Maybe in your mind they're about the same, but on the computer they're very different. You see there's two different functions. One is complex times a real, the other is complex times a complex. They have very different implementations. They're not the same thing. Um, if this was a matrix times a matrix, the star would still be the character we use, and yet it would be another implementation. Or if it was a matrix times a scalar, there would be another implementation, right? So this star is overloaded, that's the word, and the actual function or method that we use, the, the, the word in Julia is method, depends on the types of the arguments. And so in Julia we call these methods, and you can actually see how many methods are defined by star. It turns out there's going to be 364 methods. It's going to completely fill up the screen. Let's go for it. I'll, I'll, right here, here we are at the, at the bottom of it all. Well, if I try to sort of move this up, it's kind of hard to move this up here. Let's grab the thing here. Uh, way to the top, 364 methods, right? That's a lot. You could see there's big int times big float, or uh, Boolean times complex I'm seeing, or rational times integer is another one I'm spotting. Um, some of the linear algebras, like um, you can multiply lower triangular matrices, uh, which is special, right? All of these things are defined in Julia, and they all overload the simple star character, right? So these are all methods for the multiply operator. Let's go back down again. I know this is a little dizzying. Okay, so there they are. Here's all the methods of star. Okay, 
Now, that would be cool enough that you can use the same character whether you're multiplying lower triangular matrices or complex numbers. Uh, but what's really cool about Julia is that the star operator propagates. So any function that uses star will be able to make use of it. And this is called generic programming. And I'll give you some examples. I can take the product of four complex numbers, right? So star means multiply two objects. Prod means take the, the product from left to right of a vector. So, uh, so this is defined as a star b star a star b, and of course it propagates. In other words, you don't have to rebuild prod. It just uses the star as it's defined. Right, or here's prod of some integers. I mean, I guess I can go prod of, you know, I could actually take four two by two matrices. These are random matrices. Here's a vector, right? The, the, the thing inside the brackets is a vector of length four and every element is a two by two matrix. And because prod knows that make, to use the matrix multiply star, it just gives the product of my four random matrices. If I give it again, do it again, I'll get different matrices, they're random. But you see the point, that you can build higher order functions based on what you've done before. And so uh, this generic programming thing is very, very powerful. It actually lets you set things up that you can uh, define a star on your laptop and it could work on a GPU, right, or on a parallel computer. You see, so it's not only about extending functions, but it's also about using different architectures. And so it's a terrific organizational principle. And uh, it's one of the key, key elements of, of what makes Julia special. The, the ability to do this and to do this with performance is, is, is a remarkable thing. So let's take a little bit more. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me, how do computers work? What, what is the series of transformations that a code does? You know, that people might hear that there's assembly language at the bottom of the computer you know, the bottom of the software stack, but nobody ever wants to look at it, or at least some people do, but very often people don't want to look at it. Well, Julia lets you look at it, and you're not required to look at it, but it's kind of nice for small snippets of code to do this once in your life, to take a look at, at, uh, at, at um, the various layers of code. So uh, the main layers below Julia code are the lowered code, the typed code, the LLVM code and the native code. So the lowered code is basically Julia without the so-called syntactic sugar, which means that it's kind of harder for humans to read it, but it's still Julia code. The code type um, puts the types in even, as you know, you don't always have to put types in. The, code, the type code will uh, do the type inference so you can get the types even if you didn't do it. Um, the LLVM compiler, this is the uh, commonly used compiler nowadays. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Julia was able to be built. You can see how the LLVM code looks. And actually, I do like looking at the assembly code. This is on my Mac. Um, I have x86. Probably many of you have x86 code as well. Uh, but it is interesting to look at it. And so here, let's get started. Um, here is the lowered code. Okay. And so uh, here, what I'm going to do is take the complex number A times C, and I'm going to change C a couple of times, right? So here, we're going to take a complex number times a real number, and you can see what happens that this percent one argument is getting the real part, and we multiply it by X. Um, the imaginary part is getting into percent three. We multiply it by X, stored in four, and then we're going to put two and four together and return five, okay? It's Julia. It's harder to read, but there it is. It's, there's the lowered code. Okay, and so um, it's straight line code. Each line only does one function call, and the result of each line is assigned this percent n variable as you must have noticed. Okay, now let's go to the code typed, and you can see it's basically the same, but all the these floats are put in. Okay, I, let me go ahead now and sort of change to another one of these cases so we can see what happens. Let's go ahead and change it to this complex number. Okay, it's a little bit longer, but you realize it's pretty easy to follow once you look at it. You see the four multiplies, the add and subtract, and just sort of the assignments of variable names. Okay, and then here you can see the type code, and again, you can see the floats and the complexes floating around. Okay, 
And we could, if we do this, it'll be a little more mysterious because it calls this function. Um, but you can see that here it's actually just calling the broadcast. Okay, and uh, this is kind of, you could actually go through the broadcast, but it's kind of hard to look at. Okay, but you can make sense of it if you looked at it. Okay, let's go back to, let's go back to this case and let's look at the LLVM code. So this is, as you could expect, further out, down. Here's the LLVM code. I actually find these, this one may be the hardest to read. Uh, but you know, get pointer, load, insert element. But you can look at an LLVM manual, and for something this small, you can sort of find your way through and see exactly how it's working. Okay, uh, let's pick another case. Let's go back to the complex. And uh, we, we looked at these two already. Here, let's see. I guess we have the... I should see four float point, well, here it is, floating multiple, floating multiple, floating multiple, floating multiple. There is a float subtraction and a float add, right? And the rest is like get pointers and, and stuff like that. So you can read it. And then finally, and this is kind of fun to do, is to actually see the assembler. Again, people don't look at assembler very much, but you can find out what everything does. For example, you can look at, um, you could actually guess what this is, but I, I can... Um, Google VMOL SD, and you can see that this is VMOL SD is is multiply scalar double precision floating point value, kind of what you might have expected it would be, right? So there it is. Um, there's this. There's multiply. There's the add. There's the subtract, and some data movement, you know, into registers or something, right? So you can work your way through. These are of course comments. So just these V commands are mainly the x86 pieces that are relevant, okay? Okay, and the way we got this was the code native output. Okay, so the conclusion is Julia allows you to look all the way to the exact instructions which will run on the CPU. Um, your uh, TA Shashi made this notebook and says, isn't that cool and I couldn't agree more. And uh, we hope you get a feeling as to what makes Julia a little more special than other languages with this talk. Thank you very much.